All right, everyone. Welcome to uh, the fourth MicroMouse lecture and the final lecture for this quarter before uh, before we get to the rat competition. So Ooh. we'll be talking about infrared sensing today. But before that, we have a few announcements for you all. Uh, Thanksgiving's on Thursday. Happy almost Thanksgiving. And uh, Probably yeah. tell them about the workshop date change. So yeah. remember our workshop or our rack competition is on December 10th. That's where you'll be able to basically just show off everything you've done this quarter. Um, in preparation for that, we're going to be hosting a workshop to help you work through some bugs you're having. Um, one that'll motivate you to work on the assignment before the workshops. So you can come to the workshop for help. Um, note that that was originally scheduled to be on Thursday, but that is now on Saturday. And the reason that is being moved from Thursday for, to Saturday is because that Thursday is actually the GB reveal. Tyler and I are both leading GBs. You guys should definitely join GBs. They're very fun, very social. And you just like, yeah, why not join a GB? Applications are open now. You should definitely apply. Uh, next thing is I realized today after my Altium license uh, expired that it's actually extremely easy for students to get Altium licenses. So if you're one of the people who are interested in that, literally all you have to do is go like Google, like Altium student license, enter your email, your school, and uh, make sure to not use the at g.ucla.edu, just do it at ucla.edu. Um, and while well, I'm working right now on putting something together to help you guys get started with that next quarter, not right now, because uh, well, you, you all know it's life is busy. Um, so yeah, Tyler, do you wanna hit that last bullet point? Last bullet point, yes. Okay, um, I know a lot of teams have had various technical difficulties come up, and that's fine. We've been shipping out lots of replacement parts and helping people through that. Um, just make sure if uh, you got an extension that you do go back and submit the video through the Google form, just so that we can keep track of where everyone's at. And um, if you are behind, reach out to Bradley and I if you need help, but uh, I'd, I'd say, you definitely want to have everything working by the rat competition that otherwise it kind of defeats the whole point of the rat competition yeah so uh do your best to finish up by then uh also sal to answer your question Gen gb is general board basically it's a chance for you to get to know your officers the ieee officers better it's just like they're social groups where you get to choose which gb leads which officers you want to be a group in and uh yeah, it's just IEEE's more social aspect. It's I sort see, of like social slash mentorship thing. So uh, I don't know. There's a they're all different. There's a, some uh, we we might forward some links to the a Facebook post or two that has more information about them. Okay. Um, For example, Christine, I was yeah. oh sorry, I was also in last year's Micro Mouse Leads GB, and uh, well, if you can see how that turned out. So if leading Micro Mouse or pursuing IEEE officer position is something you're interested in, then GB is a great way to uh, I was that. not in a Micro Mouse's leads GB, and I'm still here. So you don't, that's not required. OK. Um, crispy memes, uh, send memes. That's all I got to say about that. Um, enjoy the memes. Let's, uh, let's get on with the lecture. Yeah. Today, we'll be talking, first of all, about IR sensors. So how they work. We'll talk about the circuitry, how we put them together on our breadboard, and then uh, we'll, we'll mention some important parameters regarding them along the way. And uh, we'll, well, you need a way to interpret the sensor data, so we'll be talking about that as well. So let's talk about IR sensors. <gasps> Wait, who's that? It's Spider Rat. Oh my god. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, so we're going to be using three different IR sensors. So I guess Spider Rat is jealous that we're catching up to him as far as number of eyes. But um, let's, uh, let's get going. So what is IR sensing? Why do we use it? So uh, basically, um, the uh, Bradley, I'm going to do these slides out of order. I'm going to change the script last minute. OK, so here's how IR sensing works. So we have, a, we have an IR emitter that uh well it sends out infrared light it bounces off an object and then an infrared receiver picks it up and then uh it 
the receiver, uh, the more light that is uh, it sees reflected, then uh, the more uh, current will go through it and we can detect that. So um, if, it's, if an object is closer, then if you're bouncing a light off something that's really nearby, a lot more light will be reflected than if it's far away. And also the uh, color of the material that you're working with and the material itself uh, will affect how much it's reflected. For example, uh, I did some tests with this. If you have a black surface in front of the sensor versus a white piece of paper, uh, the white one will reflect a lot more. So uh, that's, uh, that's what infrared sensing is. So now uh, why do you use it? So it's pretty easy to implement. You just need a receiver and emitter, and then uh, yeah, a few components. So it's contactless, so you don't actually need to touch what you're, anything to detect distance. And uh, it's a way to get an analog reading so that you can actually gauge a distance as opposed to just, oh, there's something here or there isn't. You can actually sense distances. Uh, some of the drawbacks of this sensing method, uh, it's affected by ambient light. So if you set your rat up in, uh, in a living room where there's a lot of windows and sunlight coming in, then it will, the readings will uh, be higher than uh, when it's nighttime and there's not as much light. So the sun and fire are a couple examples of light sources that emit lots of higher light. Um, they're not linear, uh, as you saw on the other slide. Uh, the, uh, the it's not a linear relationship between one distance equal one reading equals this distance, and then it doesn't linearly increase with distance. So uh, that makes it a little hard to read. Like measure, you can't use it as a replacement for a tape measure. So you gotta uh, there's some fun stuff with that. It is possible to extract a distance from an IR reading, but uh, it's not the most reliable thing. I've done right. some experimentation with that. It takes a lot of data collection, and a lot of that data collection may not even be worth it because, as we mentioned, it changes a lot based on the ambient lighting. Right. And then uh, as far as the sensors themselves, um, you might have two sensors next to each other reading the same light source, and they're going to give you different values, kind of like our motors uh, in assignment three. So if you rem so even if you set them to the same speed, they might turn slightly different. So kind of the same idea here. And uh, I already touched on this earlier, but different materials will give you different readings as well. So uh, that's uh, that's why we use it. Uh, okay. So all right. Go ahead. You guys are ready to get into all the nitty gritty details of how IR sensing actually works? Um, it's time to get into the circuitry. Uh, don't worry, it, it's going to look complicated, but we'll break it down nice and easy for you. So before we show any more circuits, does anyone have any questions about how they work? I think yes. they're, I think they're pretty straightforward. But if anyone has any clarifying questions, uh, type yes in the chat if you're ready to uh, get an information dump about uh, building circuits. Yeah. Type yes in the chat. Okay. Sweet. Wow. Okay. Cool. That's a lot of them. Cool. Let's yeah. Keep going. All right. Here is our emitter circuit. Um, so as we mentioned, we have two circuits. There's the emitter that emits the IR light, and there's the receiver that receives the IR light. This circuit is responsible for receiving the IR light. Um, the first main component we'll want to highlight. Taylor, Tyler, do you want to get up the laser pointer? I love the laser pointer. Thank you for asking. All right, oh. so we have our IR emitter. That is just an LED that emits IR light. Um, one, the one we're specifically using is that one. Yeah, it's uh, named. That's how it's named. Yeah. Uh, it runs off one point. It has one point three volt voltage drop. Draws twenty milliamps. Eight hundred nanometers. That's the most important thing. The wavelength it emits peaks at eight hundred eighty nanometers. Uh, we also note the viewing angle is kind of shallow. We want a small viewing angle because that means the light it emits is very concentrated and therefore we'll get a higher intensity that's reflected back that we can measure. Okay, um, um, we, okay. There's, a, there's a picture on a couple slides later that yeah. kind of highlights what those are. So don't worry if that's not clear just yet. Yeah, okay. So breaking this circuit down, we have 
the IR emitter, that's the main thing we're turning on and off. R1 right above that limits the current through the emitter because whenever you have an LED, you wanna make sure you limit the current because an LED is kind of greedy sometimes and it may want to blow itself up by drawing too much current. It's like, it's like an engineer, you know, engineers tend to take on more work than they can handle and then they'll stress themselves out and then self implode, you know? I'm that sure feels some like, of you guys can relate to doing that. Bradley, that feels like a personal attack, excuse me. Okay, I see that, I see <laughs> that in everyone. It is in no way a personal attack, Tyler. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. All right. <laughs> okay, moving on, right below the IR emitter, you have Q1, that is an N-channel MOSFET and that just turns on our LED. That allows us to connect our LED to the MCU pin, turn it on and off. We can't drive it directly from the MCU pin because the MCU pin has limitations on current and stuff like that. Um, R2 is a pull down resistor. And due to the way MOSFETs function, specifically N channel MOSFETs, if you, face, if you turn on the input from the MCU and then turn it off, the output or the IR LED will stay high because the MOSFET has some internal capacitance. So what that resistor does is it basically allows our LED to turn off when our MCU pin is low. R3 is pretty simple. It just limits the current flowing into the MOSFET. Um, and then C1 and C2 are more bypass capacitors, like what we had on the H bridge. Those just stabilize the supply voltage, make everything nice and smooth. Uh, does anyone right. have any questions about this circuit? Tyler, do you have anything you want to add? I want to, yeah. The uh, it's really similar to it's the same idea as what we were doing with the uh, when we were talking about the H bridge, how uh, we use a transistor to switch the uh, to control the current direction. So it's kind of similar idea here, just with an LED, use a MOSFET because it has a better response time and other characteristics for uh, this application. But, um, okay. Yeah, All so. Right. On to the receiver circuit now, I think. Yes. Yep. Okay, this one, this one is a little more simpler, but a little more simple, but it, it's gonna take, it, it needs a little bit more breaking down because it's not as straightforward. Um, so first off, we have our phototransistor, that's Q1. Um, that's what receives the light. Uh, the main thing we want to notice, uh, it, it has an eight, the one we're using uh, has a peak wavelength that it's receptive to of 870 nanometers, which is very, very close to the 808 nanometers of the emitter. So that's, that's good. That means they're emitting and detecting the same wavelengths of light, which is what we want. Um, okay, so generally, the idea behind this circuit is the more light detected by the photodiode, the more current flows through the photodiode which means by Ohm's law, more, um, if you have more current flowing through the resistor below, that leads to a larger voltage drop because V equals IR. Um, and then we measure that voltage drop relative to ground on our output pin, which goes to the MCU. And that is how we read how much light flows in or light is detected by the phototransistor. Um, does that make sense? The, just the general idea of how that works? Thumbs up if that makes sense. Okay, sweet. Um, there, just note that there is a little bit of nuance in choosing that resistor. Um, we use 1.8 kilo ohms. Um, we won't get into too much of how specifically we chose that value, but uh, yeah, Tyler, if you have anything you want to add. Yeah, so um, if you're wondering why it's all it says uh, you want emitter voltage be 3.1 volts. Uh, the reason basically uh, you want it so the brightest in the under the brightest conditions that you're going to be uh, seeing uh, you want the current to be you want the emitter voltage to be at 3.1 volts and the reason that's not 3.3 is because uh, the voltage drop across the photodiode is 0.2 volts and the reason why is just because the physical characteristics of uh, those devices so um, don't don't worry too much about why that's the case but if you want to talk about it in more depth feel free to ask 
some other time. Yes, it's it's a little more complicated than you would expect intuitively. Right. But um, all you need to know is we can read a voltage at the uh, thing, and it'll be higher if there's more light. Mm -hmm. All right. Right. So on to some tips and tricks for implementing this hardware. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the emitter and receiver should use very similar wavelengths because it needs to be able to receive the light that you're emitting. Uh, you can see that even though it says 880 millimeters, you can see on the, the graph on the top right, that is the wave, that is the emission spectrum of our IR emitter taken from its data sheet. So you can see that even though our IR receiver receives 870 nanometers, there still is definitely a lot of 870 nanometer light that's emitted by our emitter. Um, yeah, because like it, obviously it's not just a single like peak uh, at 880 nanometers, and our emitter is also receptive to light at like not exactly 870 nanometers. Uh, physically, on how when they're laid out, they should be very close to each other because again, that minimizes the distance that the light has to travel, and it makes it so all, a majority of the reflected light will come straight back to the receiver. Um, to also help with that, I mentioned the the viewing angle, the graph in the bottom right wait that is that graph in the bottom right right Taylor that's Tyler that's the one you took from the data sheet you can see a pretty small viewing angle um that just like keeps it very intense right towards the start um we mentioned the phototransistor resistors just make sure that's uh not something you guys should have to deal with since we have already have picked the right resistance values but um if you ever implement receiving circuits in the future that's just something to keep in mind um, one thing that will come up when you eventually design an IR breakout board is that for the PCBs, uh, since we're dealing with analog signals here, we want the signals to be as clean as possible, which means you're going to want to use thick traces on your PCBs. So the current um, is not affected by the circuit itself, but it's or not affected by the implementation of the circuit, but it's affected most by the IR values and the readings you're getting. Um, yeah. That's most of the tips and tricks that we had in mind. I'm, I'm about to start talking about some software hacks and stuff to deal with the readings. So before we switch switch gears to that, um, this is your opportunity to ask any clarifying questions on uh, anything you see here. Um, if you are good, ready to go, then uh, drop it yes in the chat and we'll uh, continue on to the software stuff yeah oh oh also one thing i want to know i want to <laughs> note as <laughs> as a tip for implementing the circuit um if you notice the ir photodiodes are diodes which means that they only work in one direction so if you are building your circuit and you notice that your voltage readings are extremely low and not very reactive try flipping your photodiode the other direction uh, that should that at least one of you is probably going to run into that issue, and that should save a good amount of we, time. We say that because uh, because I ran into the issue two times in a row. Uh, that was nice. So uh, also run into that issue very often. So you are not yet. Yeah. Yeah. If both of your leads ran into that issue, there's a good chance that someone will run into that. Okay, um, we'll clarify that in assignment. But looks like people are ready to move on. In general, so uh, let's, uh, let's keep going. So we have a few tips and tricks in the software. So we're trying to read uh, these values. So if you recall what I said earlier, the IR LED turns on, sends light out, bounces off the wall, and then the photodiode will uh, react to that. And, but what you'll notice here is that there's a, what this is, is a, from the time you tell the LED to turn on, the time it takes for the uh, the reading to stabilize is not zero. It's not instantaneous. So it does take some time to react. So if you start taking readings while it's while the photodiode reading is rising, then it might throw off your measurement. It might make the average lower than if you only took readings from once it was stabilized. So uh, I measure this with an oscilloscope. So it, for our, our breadboard, it takes about 60 microseconds for 
the reading to stabilize. And then at, at that point, you can start taking readings. OK, so uh, the, there's this delay function that we've created for you that uh, can uh, pr you can tell it to delay for a very precise amount of time before you do other things. So that's why that will be important. Uh, the other thing is you should only uh, you should only read from one emitter and have one one receiver and have one emitter turned on at the same time. Uh, this uh, the, the, an easy way to think about it is if you have two flashlights and you're trying to measure the brightness of one of them, it doesn't make any sense to have both of them turned on at the same time. You only want the one that you're trying to measure on. Otherwise, the light will interfere and make the other reading uh, artificially brighter. So, um, so part so it also like I said, it takes some time for the LEDs the reading to stabilize and turn on all the way. Um, it'll take after you turn it off, it'll take some time for that to dip back down. So if you're reading several, uh, if you're reading several from several different sensors in succession, then uh, you can see here. So the purple one turns on. You can take readings, but then when you turn off, and then you there should be a little delay before you start reading from the the, uh, the sensor that's attached to the yellow signal in this case. So uh, the delay accounts for that. So uh, you don't have to think about that too much. Uh, last little thing, or last two little things. Um, when you, uh, you, you'll, you'll realize this when you're actually implementing it in uh, your uh, PAD stuff. Um, don't call, don't try to read from your IR uh, sensors within PID because PID is in Cystic. Cystic should not take very long to run, but the uh, we have a delay function takes 60 microseconds, and then there's three different sensors you're trying to read from. So by if you include it in the PID control function, then it will kind of will uh, bottleneck your program. So don't do and that. The reason the reason we don't want to do that is because uh, sys remember cystic gets called very it gets called based on the clock frequency so it needs to finish in a specific time before it gets called again. So if we have if sys if the if the cystic function takes too long to complete, then basically it will never finish and it'll just it'll it'll be bad. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, and then uh. I guess last note here, this is more an advanced trick that we'll tell you how to implement later, but for now, just you, you'll kind of ignore this, but um, for future reference. So the IR uh, LEDs are, if you're right up, if you're really close to wall, it's really bright and it kind of drowns out the uh, sensor. So if you're touching the wall versus when you're five millimeters to the wall from the wall versus one centimeter, Whenever you're in that range where you're really close, it's all going to look the same to the sensor. It's all going to look really bright. So one way to so that that means you don't really you don't know if you're really if you're touching the wall if you're just really close to it. So one hack, if you want to call it that, to get resolution at that distance is to use pulse width modulation, kind of like how we control motor speeds uh, in assignment two. You can use that technique also to uh, you can use that technique to make the LED appear dimmer so that you're not uh, that way you get better resolution when you're uh, really close to an object. So we'll, we'll you want to visualize you, or, sorry yeah it, we'll, I was we'll, say if you want to visualize that it's the yeah. same as like can you see me better now or now or like <laughs> yeah. yeah so uh, that's <laughs> We'll, we'll implement that in a future more advanced assignment, but that's there for you guys. Okay. Um, yeah. So you're, uh, so like I said, we, we took, so now you should have an idea of how we actually get different voltage values for different brightnesses, but uh, now you need to know what to do with them. So take it away, Bradley. All right. So the, this is, this is the part, if you take any part, away from this, this second half of the lecture about processing the data. This is the slide that you should pay attention to because this is the part that you will be implementing this specific, in this specific assignment. The rest of it is for future stuff and for knowledge. Um, so the simple part is what we need right now 
to make it through the maze is we need to know, is there a wall or is there not a wall? Um, that's, that's what we need to know for our, for our purposes. Um, and that's pretty easy because basically we need to get a discrete signal from an analog signal. We just need to get a simple yes or no out of an analog value. And to do that, you just need to say, um, if there's a wall, we know that our reading is going to be above the certain above the certain value because a lot enough IR light is going to be being reflected. So what you are going to do is you're going to need to find a value such that if the reading is above that value, then you know that there is a wall. If the reading is below that value, then you know there is no wall. Um, note that this graph that you're seeing is not necessarily exactly what your readings were, are going to look like. It that is just a it. From what I've seen, they do look somewhat like that, but not exactly like an arctan function. Um, just so, yeah, basically find a threshold. If the readings are above that, there's a wall. If there's below that, there is no wall. Yeah, so if you Very experimentally simple. find a threshold by using your live expressions, then, I don't know, putting it next to card uh, a cardboard wall, and you're like, oh, the value is really high. And you take the wall away, oh, it's really low. So needs to be above this value to uh, register. No, there's a wall there. So that, that's all we're saying here. So that's what you'll be doing in the assignment. Mm -hmm. And you're also going to want to test this in a variety of different conditions, because if you find it working in your room with all the windows closed, because you're doing it at 2 AM, um, <laughs> it's going to act differently than if you wake up at 1 PM go into your living room with all the windows open because all that ambient light, as we mentioned earlier, is going to affect how your IRs behave. Okay. So when you pick a value, you should find one that ideally works in a majority of lighting conditions. All right. All right, we've got one more slide for you guys. This slide's going to be a little hand wavy because it's more just a primer for uh, some more fun stuff we have coming to you next quarter, since this is, after all, the last lecture of the quarter. So uh, we'll, next quarter, we'll be going into maze solving algorithms, but also we'll be talking about some more advanced algorithms for processing your data that are a little smarter than just, oh, is there a wall there or not? So uh, what, what is sensor fusion? Uh, sensor fusion is just combining the readings from two or more sensors to get a more reliable measurement. So if you look at the outputs over time for any one sensor, it might be all over the place. It might, it might, it won't be just very stable. So there's like a kind of range of uncertainty and it'll, it'll have like an average value or something, but then a different sensor might have a, be saying something else. So you can kind of like, so we'll, we'll go into the math of this in the future lectures, but basically if you look at this at the top, figure here, two red signals, they both have this kind of range of, uh, of uncertainty and they have an average value. So you could, there's a sense of fusion intelligently combines them together to get a better idea of what the actual uh, measure, what the actual value should be. And then uh, when we're take when we're, uh, we'll be playing with some things called a uh, Kalman filters, very fun. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll tell you all about how to so you can incorporate readings from your encoders, your uh, IR sensors, and then depending on what how where you go with your rat superpowers, maybe you want to uh, add a gyroscope on. I don't know, but there's a lot of ways you could do this. And if you incorporate all that data together, you can get, do some really really cool stuff. Um, the 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 most basic one would probably be uh, centering your mouse in between the maze uh, walls because uh, if you're, unless your values that you picked for turning and going straight are perfect, then it'll kind of drift over time. So now you can incorporate all your sensor data to like help it correct itself and stay centered and make perfect 90 degree turns instead of 89 degrees. Uh, it's just an example. So uh, got anything left to say about that, Bradley? Or uh, I think that's about it. Yeah, I mean, at this point, it's pretty hand wavy. All you, all you basically need to know is um, sensor fusion is a cool way of taking input from a bunch of different sensors and combining into one metric that you can really trust. Uh, so like there's error in everything we take and this just helps get rid of that.
we need you guys to suffer during the rat competition and be, <laughs> we need you to see that oh it keeps hitting the wall this sucks and then then you'll be uh you'll see why sensor fusion is going to save the day and make it really cool all right got an assignment for you guys build up your uh infrared circuitry stuff on your right and then uh get it working <laughs> that, that's all we got really yeah this is uh, uh this is where you get to get your rat to navigate through a maze it'll basically be functioning by the end of this assignment and you'll be ready for the rat competition yeah uh i, I just played gift here for fun it's, uh sort of unrelated but also related um so i'm moving a cardboard wall closer further away from an infrared sensor you can see the purple signal getting higher when it gets closer so uh yeah uh yeah we have workshop 12-5 uh, december 5th five. then uh five days later got a rock competition okay um just note that we'll also be releasing an assignment 4.2 and 4.3 tonight 4.3 4.2 will be the infrared breakout board that we will be working on next quarter. We're releasing that now because we're on the subject of infrared sensors and we want you to be able to look at that, think about that and get started on that. Um, 4.3 is an extra credit extra credit assignment where you get to practice some SMD soldering. So if you know if you put out that poll on Piazza to see what interest was, um, 4.3 will get you going on that. Right. Uh, if you're interested in doing the SMD soldering, um, take a look at that as soon as we release it so that you can place an order for your parts so that you can get started with that as soon as possible. Um, everyone can get started with the, uh, the infrared stuff on the breadboard for now. Then uh, switch over to the surface mount stuff if you uh, do end up doing that assignment. All right, uh, I think that's all from Bradley and I. I'm gonna stop the recording here, but. Uh, does anyone have any questions about stuff we went over? Sweet. All right.